Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Bosworth. Welcome to Sunday Night. I am live streaming here again from my uh, my office and having uh, a pretty good uh, evening so far in that I think everything is working according to my end. So when you can hear me, it sure is uh, comforting to see the posts that say your sound is working and it's uh, looking good. So uh, there is a few minute delay between what I do and what I see. So I will keep, uh, before I dive into the real heart of this evening, I will wait to hear, wait to see some of those um, some of those comments. <clears throat> so I am coming to you live from South Dakota and I have a couple things I wanna do tonight. I am gonna start by just checking uh, my numbers, which is what I tell my patients to do. I am an internal, oh, thank you very much, Flash Gordon 1023. Uh, he says the sound is good. That's very comforting. <laughs> so I'm just gonna show you a little bit about how I check numbers. A lot of uh, what I have for you tonight is around how well, how can you know if you're too intense on the ketogenic diet? And part of that uh, answer has to do with um, how well you're checking. So I'm just gonna show you that at the beginning of this uh, broadcast, my sugar is 75 and I'm about to take my fork here and check my my uh, ketones. And again, some of the things people have had troubles with, if you can see that little blinking blood drip there, you do not wanna touch this to your, your uh, finger poke until that uh, blinking blood drop is there. Uh, the blood glucose comes back in about five seconds, but it takes a little closer to 10 seconds for your ketones to come back. And uh, this uh, is the beginning of my, uh, of my evening. So we're gonna show you a couple things that I'm really uh, happy to share and teach my patients. Uh, this is a 75 divided by 0 0.8. So that probably gets you around 140 Dr. Boz ratio. Um, for those of you that don't know how to calculate a Dr. Boz ratio, there is a spreadsheet in the show notes below that you can download, and it is an interactive uh, uh, spreadsheet. Several of you have said, I just wanna print it out. It's, I want a PDF, don't do the m math for me. But uh, <clears throat> the one that you download off of the website is interactive and uh, just makes the math a lot easier for my patients. And uh, I really have a good, uh, um, good lecture for you tonight and I have uh, started this thought process probably, f I don't know, probably two months ago. Uh, this is gonna be one of the chapters in my book about what is the most intense level of a ketogenic diet and is there such thing as going too far on a ketogenic diet? Um, many times I'll have patients write in saying, you know, my mom is a very, you know, is very sick with cancer or um, um, immune problems or, uh, has had um, a lot of weight loss, and I don't want her to lose any weight. Is it, is it okay for her to go on the ketogenic diet? And I will tell you the answer is never just a blanket answer that fits everybody, but uh, you have to be checking your numbers in order to do that. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I um, put out a challenge there to, to folks to keep track of their numbers and share their spreadsheets back with me. I have had an overwhelming number of people send me their spreadsheets to take a look at. It is a, a, in pretty easy for me once I see the data lined up in a very f organized way to, to better advise patients. Um, this uh, channel though is all about educating you and educating the folks out there who wanna learn more about the ketogenic diet. So we start out by, uh, I've got a few p folks out there who are posting their numbers, that's very good. Uh, th that's exactly how, uh, if you wanna skip to the end of this video, the punchline is the, is the ketogenic too much? I don't know, you should look. And it, don't leave it up to your physician to do that. Um, you looking at your numbers multiple times a day throughout a journey of health is far better than uh, going into your doctor, paying the copay and saying, doc, can you check my metabolism? Because no matter what test I do when, my patients, when patients come into my clinic, it will only be measuring that one point in time. 
And I think that really is a disservice to someone's metabolism. It is a very dynamic and changing equation for patients. Um, most powerfully, I've had some really sick patients that I did not have tools in my toolbox to help them as of five years ago. But the longer I, um, I have practiced the ketogenic diet, the better I have been at helping those really sick patients. Uh, so this is one of those uh, advanced keto lectures that if you're looking for um, some evidence to, to show relatives or even your own physician about what, am I doing something that could be dangerous for my health. Uh, this ketogenic diet has uh, some missed truths, some misinformation out there, uh, but I'm gonna show you some of the things that I use in my clinic. And again, I'm internal medicine, so I do all I can to get people off of prescriptions and stay away from surgery. Uh, there's hardly a better way that I've delivered that service uh, than I have in the last five years. All right, so the other thing I wanted to do while I was live is I had a lot of questions over the last few weeks about what's the difference between a product that has just BHB and a product that just has BHB plus uh, C8, C10 or a fat in it. And I am uh, I thought I was gonna actually use this one, but it's empty. Uh, this is just the BHB or the keto salts. And you saw my numbers at the beginning of this. I'm gonna um, mix up the only one I have, <laughs> which is a BHB with a fat in it. Um, I would not recommend this for a brand new person on a ketogenic diet or somebody who's calling me in crisis saying my mom has cancer she's going to the hemato or going to the oncologist um, should I start her on a supplement and I would not ask her liver to make ketones just yet I would use just a salt if I was supplementing for somebody who's on a ketogenic diet so this is with some water and um, I will drink this while I talk to you about the lecture I've prepared and then I will check my numbers at the end of this just to give you a demonstration that I do this too. I do this to show my patients, but it's also a way for me to measure my metabolic health um, because as I continue uh, to improve my health, um, I, have, I have goals that I try to reach for mine as well. And we'll get to those as we go along. So I just wanna say thank you for all of those folks that have checked in and I see a bunch of your comments. Uh, I will be coming back to answer some of those questions when I get done with this. Um, some things that are really helpful for me though is if you tell me where you're from. I've learned this little classroom on YouTube has uh, far reaching boundaries all the way around the globe. So it's really nice to see that. The other thing is I would love you to help me spread this word for the ketogenic diet. I bring this to you every Sunday night and really try to make this a valuable education. If you can help me out by giving me a thumbs up on the video, that actually matters on, on a YouTube video in hopes that other people can see it. So the more thumbs up we have on a video, the better we can spread the word about other people learning about the ketogenic diet. So um, I will start by saying, let's go over here and um, and just uh, one quick uh, announcement before I do this. So we are gonna talk about um, an advanced ketogenic diet. As I do this, I'm about to push play and that turns into a time where I cannot see the comments. So if you, um, uh, just have forgiveness if anything goes wrong. I have somebody that calls me and tells me if this isn't working right. So um, we are gonna talk about the most advanced version of a ketogenic diet. Uh, I need to click one more thing here, here we go. Uh, and push play. All right, yes, yeah, so I'm gonna take a quick drink. So uh, <clears throat> PKD not PKU, which is something in medical school, which is also a metabolic uh, processing disorder. PKD is um, the initials for the most advanced ketogenic diet that I use in my patients. I wanna make sure to give 100% of the credit for my education to the team in Hungary, uh, Poland area that uh, has done the research on this. Please take a careful look at the uh, notations of the slides because the credit is to them. They are my teachers so that I can kind of use this in my patients but also teach folks about um, what their research is just uh, on the edge of uh, really transforming the ketogenic diet. So PKD stands for Paleolithic Ketogenic Diet, PKD. Uh, that is not um, 
an accident that it's shortened. Uh, we do not want you to confuse this with the paleo diet. Um, Paleolithic really is those the, the term that means a very um, ancestral uh, heritage of a type of diet. Uh, ketogenic stands for that you check your finger, you check your numbers, and you are producing ketones. Um, a paleolithic ketogenic diet is no vegetables or very limited if, if any. Um, no fruit, but that's pretty close to a ketogenic diet. Um, no vegetable oils, no seed oils, uh, no supplements. Uh, and I don't mean added ketones, I mean extra vitamins, extra iron, extra, um, extra, extra. <laughs> uh, just uh, there's no supplements used in this diet. Uh, also, no spices like cumin or cinnamon. Um, some of the <laughs> some of some folks found that one actually quite limiting. When you finally took away all of these other things, how did you add any flavor to your diet? Um, but uh, I will tell you that the, you're going to come back full circle when we get to the end of this. So just some other ways to know this diet is there are no grains. That's true for a ketogenic diet or most ketogenic diets. Um, there's no milk. There's no dairy. Uh, I often get the, one, the question, is there any butter? I'll tell you, butter is one of the first things I add back in when I'm using the PKD. Um, no refined sugars. And then no nightshades, which are tomatoes potatoes, obviously, bell peppers, peanuts. Uh, these um, are all heavily uh, filled with lectins, which are, again, another um, part of the diet that can really inflame our, uh, our patients. Uh, no artificial sweeteners, but that's uh, pretty standard. So when you hear about the paleolithic diet, uh, paleolithic ketogenic diet, uh, the first thing I like to point out are, let's just unpack what is the ketogenic diet. Uh, you're gonna have three things we're gonna look at in these uh, comparisons. We're looking at fat, the percentage of protein, and the percentage of carbs. Uh, so you'll, you'll match up those colors with fat being blue, protein being white, and carbs being red. So in a ketogenic diet, the carbohydrates are about 10%, your proteins are about 15%, and the ketogenic diet is about 75%. Uh, for any of you that have taken the time to read my book, I don't talk about percentages of the macros in my book because I think it is overwhelming to folks at first. I simply say 20 carbohydrates or less a day, and that's not talking about net, that's simply 20 carbohydrates or less per day. And when you're just starting out on the ketogenic diet, keeping it simple is really important. So these macros are something I don't go into much in my book, um, and but have used them as points of education. So the other mistake that I have uh, folks do when I start teaching them about the paleolithic ketogenic diet is they think I'm talking about a paleo diet. Uh, again, paleo short for paleolithic, uh, meaning this ancestral type of diet. When you look at um, what a paleo diet really is in comparison to what we just showed you as a ketogenic diet, uh, again, fat, protein, and carbs uh, divided into these colors. The carbohydrates are about 25% in a paleo diet. Your fats are about 40% and your, your proteins are about 40%. When you look, it's almost thirds, if you would, uh, on a paleo diet, but it's a little less carbs than um, what the exact thirds would be. Um, I, I show that because it is often confused, and I brought this up a few weeks ago. Um, boy, I got a lot of questions. Um, let's just now go to a PKD, Paleolithic Ketogenic Diet. And this, you can see there's just this tiny little sliver of red. You could almost say there are no carbohydrates in a uh, Paleolithic Ketogenic Diet, uh, just for teachable purposes, I left it at 1% for carbs, 75% for fat, and 34% for protein. What you're looking at for fat to protein is almost a two to one. Two fat uh, grams of food for one protein gram of food. Uh, and that is an extremely, extremely ketogenic diet. Um, you say, well, who would be interested in a paleolithic ketogenic diet? Um, when I look at, uh, so again, just kind of making sure I, I don't lose my audience here. This is not a paleo diet. And I would tell you it's really not a, it, it is a very carnivorous diet, but if you Google uh, a carnivore diet, um, it, it really does have, um, uh, a lot, a, a bit more protein in a carnivore diet when I look at what different meats the uh, folks on a carnivore diet eat versus what is recommended on a paleolithic ketogenic diet. 
So I would say it's not carnivore in the sense that the popular definition of carnivore. Instead, I would call it, yep, it's carnivorous, but it's very specific types of, of meats that, uh, and fat that we're looking at. So the Paleolithic ketogenic diet is animal fat. Yes, uh, it is red meat. It's not that there's no white meat in there, I just think that first uh, layer of meat should be um, um, red meat and then offal, which is organ meat. Um, that organ meat uh, is incredibly rich in vitamins. Uh, the, P the PKD has eggs in it, one of, the, one of the staples. And again, when you really break it down to, when I talk to nutritionists about, nutritionists about this, it is a two to one fat to protein ratio when you're on a paleolithic ketogenic diet. All right, um, so yes, there's the picture of a PKD with that tiny little sliver, 75% uh, fat, uh, you know, half of that's protein and then that little bitty wiggle of a room for carbohydrates. So you say, Doc, why would you do this? And I say, well, I really use a science-based platform to um, advise my patients, especially the ones that I need to put on a PKD. They are the sickest of patients in my internal medicine group and in my in my clinic. And I do not uh, think this is necessary for every person out there to get better. But when they present to me with some of the problems we're gonna talk about in the next 15 to 20 minutes, this, um, Di this uh, test called a PEG or polyethylene glycol 400 test measures are things leaking through their gut that shouldn't be. Now I went into this a few weeks ago and I think I was a little over the heads of folks so I'm gonna repeat some of this. Uh, so if you've seen this, you can either go grab a cup of coffee or you can dial in and, sh and just, I, I think the second time around this is gonna do a lot better. This is a picture of the cells on the inside uh, lining of your gut. So we call this, um, these enterocytes or the, the mucosal lining of your gut. And inside that mucosal lining, most of those t cells are enterocytes. Those are the red ones with the nice dark red nucleuses in them. Uh, but you also have goblet cells which make the slime or the mucus, and you have panis cells which make digestive enzymes in your, in your gut. That blue layer is supposed to represent your mucous membrane and the white part at the top of this picture is really where the food travels along and your body should be grabbing the nutrients out of that food and putting it through these enterocytes, through these uh, cell linings, deeper into that lamina propria and then we absorb those nutrients into our system. So it's a cellular level, but I really think it's worth talking about again. Um, that little green guy over there is actually a nerve cell, a dendritic cell that uh, allows us to sense the, uh, not just the movement of food, but the health of our immune system will be uh, turned on or signaled to the rest of the body through those dendrit dendritic cells. So when you look at the plasma cells, that is our defense system. If you look at the most dangerous place in our body, we eat things, and if we eat something that's not, uh, not safe for our body, it's these little, uh, this little army of cells that keeps us protected. And this army of cells is backed up by plasma cells, which will gobble up the bad guys and gobble up those foreign objects and then either do away with them or create a recipe to attack them. Uh, we need this defense system to be healthy and plump and well nourished. You'd think the food's right there, shouldn't it be well nourished? But as you see what happens in most people, we talk about these little tight junctions, those little staples at the top of your enterocytes that really don't do well over time with patients that have irritable bowel patients who have allergies, patients who have a poor immune system, folks who've had a, an infection over and over and over again, it very, very related to an intestinal mucosa that, I don't like this word, it leaks. And the slang term on the internet is called, it's a leaky gut. Now, I don't like that word. I like intestinal permeability problems and they come in phases. So phase one of intestinal permeability, you'll just see all those cells just kind of slide a little bit apart. And uh, that's not the worst thing in the world. You'll have times in your life where that happens, but you should put them right back together again as soon as you're feeling better. Times of a fever, times of allergies, you're gonna see all those little cells separate and you're gonna ask your body to say, hey, uh, keep those staples nice and tight. Don't let any of the bad guys in um, or the body 
uh, starts to do things that are very under the radar. You cannot really get a lab test for me to check for intestinal permeability at phase one. But boy, if I do a reverse history, we find that um, these sodium um, uh, solutes are one of the, the little sneaky things that fits in between those cell linings. And you do, you have uh, increased swelling by sodium coming in, but you also lose sodium at an inappropriate rate. It is not regulated. And this is very common in those first phases of a swollen intestinal lining. Um, and they don't present with a gut that hurts. They are patients who say, I just don't feel well. I haven't felt well for a couple years. Most patients never come see me with an intestinal permeability at phase one. Uh, they just kind of say, this must be a bad day. They kind of blow it off and you should, that your body should get better, um, but not if uh, the problem keeps getting worse. Phase two, these things separate a little bit further. You'll see that the spaces between the cells now are wider. Uh, now I've got folks with, uh, with autoimmune problems, like if they scratch their skin, they get a really big welt, uh, or if they get around hay fever, their body really reacts. Um, they're, these, you can see those staples are just barely keeping those cells together. They're stretched as far as they can go. And when we look at the particles that go from the outside that leak into our system, the foreign particles are one of those first uh, that do that. What is a foreign particle but an allergen? So when, if you've ever had one of those tests where they put all the needles on your back and say, what are the allergens that you're allergic to? Um, those, those foreign particles are happening in phase two where they're coming into your, in, into your body this is not an acceptable entrance. It's because your cells have, uh, are not repairing and, and really nourished with a healthy diet. Uh, and then these little red balls that got into that place called the lamina propria. Once that happens, it activates your immune system. Your immune system comes over, it turns on that plasma cell, and now it gets a little crabby. Uh, it will start sending off messages uh, to the rest of the body to say, hey, we have got a foreign invader here one of the one of the signals that tells you there's a foreign invader is this interleukin 13. Uh, it is a cytokine, which is an advanced term for a YouTube channel like this, but I really think it's worth just telling you the, the names of these things so you can go Google them. Uh, you can see the reference article that I put down there to say this is where you can see, see an evidence-based process of what's happening in this intestinal permeability phase two. Interleukin 13, it, it is uh, going to help with programmed cell de death. It's also looking uh, to modulate uh, the tumor cell growth. It inhibits uh, your tumor Im immunosurveillance, which means you've always got folks out, little cells in your system, especially in your gut, looking for dangerous cells, looking for tumor cells. And when interleukin uh, 13 gets high, you, you're just not gonna spend as much time looking to fight off those baby tiny cancer cells. Those cancer cells are gonna get to grow um, because of that distraction. So again, the monitoring for new cancer cell antibodies is not gonna happen as well when this, uh, when this is high. And it's got a mediator for tissue fibrosis. So it starts to make the gut, instead of a nice, flexible, lovely, uh, immobile, uh, malleable tissue, uh, that tissue becomes more stiff and more rigid, which is not how we were designed. Again, one of those extracellular matrix, it is a key regulator for that. So that's kind of advanced. Hang in there, this gets better. <laughs> So phase three, you'll see these are even further apart. Um, now we've got folks who uh, are in my advanced autoimmune problems. They've got maybe two or three immune problems, like their thyroid's not working right, their body is overloaded with asking about um, why, why do I have an autoimmune problem of type one diabetes and a thyroid problem, and I am hyper allergic to everything. Uh, now you've got a collection of a syndrome happening, um, and really most docs don't think of the intestine as being a big part of it. Maybe you'll have symptoms of um, uh, like irritable bowel, but uh, that's almost the doc's, doc's afterthoughts because we're so much more um, focused on what's that thyroid doing? Why is it attacking itself? Why are the joints it flaring? Uh, these other collection of something goofy is going on with that immune system. And the reason it's happening is because those little macromolecules, food antigens and bacteria now have a huge uh, entrance in and out of those cells. Once that gets under the, the inside those enterocytes in that lamina propria, boom, those plasma cells get initiated. They activate 
and you've got those interleukins that have already been happening, but this time we wake up a couple of the bad boys, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha. So TNF alpha, again, it is another enzyme. It's not something you're gonna go into your doctor and measure. Uh, the Im immunology team does look at it, but the summary I like to tell patients is when your TNF alpha is raised, your body is trying so hard to send you some, um, some signals that say, hey, um, create a fever, stop eating. It, cr lots of inflammation is, um, um, is, um, is uh, happening throughout the body. Uh, your immune cells are kind of on overdrive. It's causing uh, any kind of cell that's a little bit damaged gets programmed to have cell death. Tumor necrosis factor alpha is very important for the human body, but once it's not working right, you, it leads to other chronic inflammatory problems like there are more cancers when the TNF alpha is higher, there's more major depression, uh, psoriasis, inflammatory bowel, and Alzheimer's disease. What do these diseases have in common? All of them have these cells between their, in, uh, their enterocytes leaking in several types of, uh, of foreign objects to turn on their immune system. You say, what's this have to do with a ketogenic diet? Hang in there, don't run away. This is the nastiest one. So in this one, we take those uh, cells and you see those little staples, now they start to break. So now those last defense system is where those staples are supposed to be keeping things out, but they do not. Um, and once the staples are gone and now you have your cytokines roaring with INL13, interleukin-13, TNF-alpha, uh, those become a, a, they're stimulated by, they're, they're on overdrive. And as you watch, you're gonna see these cells start to break down. Uh, the goblet cell will also break down. Uh, and now you have an opening. So if you thought that um, my patients were malnourished before, look what happens when you take away the cells that are supposed to be protecting you from the things that come in through your food. Uh, the next thing that happens is they have lots of abdominal pain, they have gurgling, they have lots of, um, the movement of a bowel happens in a, when it shouldn't and then it stops happening uh, when you want it to move. It's not functioning in the, uh, the same plus or minus uh, signals that they're used to. Uh, you'll get a huge pocket of those uh, cytokines in there and the final result of what happens if I put a camera down and I look in those intestines I can see ulcers so that is the worst phase and those folks have low vitamin D they have low iron they have lots of uh, uh, of malnourishment because there's practically an open trap door just letting things out of their body so again those are the worst of the folks that are in there uh, when I look at how do we measure this, uh, there is a test. It's not one that we can do in America, but I think it's worth uh, teaching. And this is why this team in Hungary and Poland has been so valuable to me, is they publish the literature where they look at, when I have patients drink this uh, certain chemical, I want to know that it goes into their gut, but their, their intestine is perfectly sealed. It does not have any leaking that sh that's happening. And uh, how do I know? Because none of it ended up in their urine. Uh, so when they're not feeling well, the same, prob the same thing happens where they drink that dye, um, but throughout that intestine, you can see some of the places early in the intestine are leaking, some of the places in the middle part of the intestine, and some of the places in the large colon are leaking. And those uh, different molecules will go in at different uh, sections of the intestine, and we can actually measure those molecules in your urine for the six hours after taking it. There's lots of different ways that we can measure them, some of them done in the United States, but the PEG 400 is where most of this research comes from. I had a lot of folks write in asking me if they could get this test done. I do not know that it's, uh, I have not been able to get it done in my community. Uh, so if, if somebody does get a PEG 400 done in the United States, boy, I would love that message. But you don't need the test done once you understand what it is we're trying to accomplish. So the reason this test was so powerful is it is um, a, a 11 different sizes of proteins that some of them that are gonna fit in when the, the cells were just a tiny in that phase one, some of them fit through the, uh, the lining when the, they were in phase two of impermeability diseases, three and four. And so you have different areas of the gut that allow those uh, molecules in, and you have different, uh, different le levels of disease that allow those molecules in. You shouldn't be absorbing hardly, you know, this very little amounts uh, of those molecules, but 
Well, what's powerful about this test is if you do absorb them, they do not interact with your body. That's a really good test. We don't want it screwed up by getting metabolized within the system. Once it's absorbed, your, your kidney flushes it out the other, uh, flushes it out your urine. And the best thing that this test does is you can do this from home. They send the kid home with a patient. Uh, they get up in the morning, they empty their bladder, they drink, um, they drink the solution and they start a timer and they collect the urine for the next six hours while at home. They package that up, uh, send the container back to the lab and then the lab measures what did that patient, uh, what were those results over the six hours. So they don't have to be in the clinic to do this. So when we look at intestinal permeability, those two white lines are really kind of the normal of this is where we should have um, these different proteins uh, show up. So the molecular weight of the proteins is lined up along the bottom, and there's the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, yeah, 11 different proteins found in that test along the bottom. So again, zero, 10, maybe 20% of that could be absorbed, and that makes your, you should, that's a healthy gut. Um, but when you get up into that 25, 35, 45, 55% of that, um, of that uh, molecule was absorbed, uh, and we know that by looking at their urine, Boy, that's where things go wrong. So on this test, you can see that, that this patient's, um, the molecular weight that was 198 grams per, um, uh, per mole uh, was at like 17%. Uh, this one was at um, about 25%. The next one was at this, and you can kind of see the plots that went along. Then they'll draw a graph to say, did they fall within the, the normal or were they, did they have more leaking of, this, of these proteins uh, throughout the test? So if you look at that like 418, the molecule that's size 418, that is known to have a certain section of the gut that's supposed to absorb it uh, or that is supposed to keep it out. It doesn't fit in all areas of the gut. Uh, the different sizes of these proteins are linked to different sections of the intestine. So it allows us to check the beginning all the way to the end of your uh, uh, absorption or your, your intestinal lining. Uh, and that's the uniqueness of this test. So. PEG 400, healthy controls. Here is um, somebody who says, hey doc, I'm healthy, I got no problems. And you can see he's been on a PKD, that very advanced ketogenic diet, for four days. These people's um, Dr. Ba's ratio would likely be between 20 and 40, so very tightly controlled. Um, the next one actually is healthy. <laughs> you know, when they've been on a PKD for now four weeks. Um, and then the final one was an example of somebody who'd been on PKD for a year. Uh, so just looking at that, this is one of the places where these tests really uh, allow us to look at what's happening on a cellular level. Here's just another example of PKD uh, for the folks that had been on it for a week. So when I, again, plot out those normals that come across, uh, then we have some people who say, yeah, I'm healthy, uh, but they still probably let more proteins in through those cellular linings than they should. Uh, they've only been on PKD for, about a, for less than a week, so they're very early in their health problems. This patient, incredible, almost every number was elevated. Uh, that's one of the sickest folks that end up in my clinic are Crohn's disease, and that ulcers way at the end of their disease states happen throughout their body. Here's some other examples of multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, pancreatic tumors, diabetes type 1. And again, all of these studies came from this, uh, this um, uh, lab that I have noted down there. Uh, Dr. S uh, Zofia Clemens is the gal that I'm kind of a, I've got a, a, a girl crush on. Just She's really good at her research. She's really good at teaching. And she's very methodical about using what's happening. Am I really making the patient better? Uh, not guessing on this, but measuring those proteins along the way uh, to say, did they really improve their body? So here's some patients, again, who had been on the ketogen PKD, Paleolithic Ketogenic Diet, very advanced diet for ketosis, um, and these were on it for greater than a month. Here's some metabolic syndrome with alcohol, a very common question that I get. Um, here's another patient who had allergies, but after a month really normalized the Hashimoto's 
uh, that the one in yellow was a rectal tumor. Again, colitis being the hardest and worst of the folks that I take care of. I do love that neon blue or that uh, that pale blue one, which is a folk someone who'd been anxious and she was not following the PKD very well. And they were able to prove that by saying, you know, when the patients come in and doctors hear that their plan isn't working right, uh, it's it's heartbreaking to us too. We want them to get better, um, but when we're given every effort that we can to improve their health and things still aren't great, uh, we know that one of the equations could be that the patient isn't following this incredibly strict diet very well. And in fact, that would be the case with what happened with that patient. I just think that's, that's helpful because you can go to, um, um, to, to make sense of it is difficult actually. All right, so here is a great one. This is now a paleo diet. Remember, this is not PKD. Hold on one second. Mm. Uh, I th oh, here. I, I didn't mean to do that one. Well, it doesn't let me go backwards, so let's just keep going. All right, so here's a paleo diet. Actually, I think it just repeated it for me. The paleo diet, again, there's those percentages with the red carbs, the blue is the fat, and the white is the protein. And you look, it's not terrible, that's not bad, but watch what happens when they go from a paleolithic ketogenic diet, excuse me, a paleo diet, see even I do it, to a PKD, where you have just a sliver, almost no carbohydrates in that diet. And when they did that for just three weeks, look at how that intestinal lining really did in, improve. Um, you know, one of the curious questions Jason Fung put out in one of the first videos I ever watched on a ketogenic diet was, why is their thyroid improving? And I still can't answer that very confidently, uh, but my theory is that you decrease the stimulation uh, of those uh, plasma cells from these leaky gut uh, syndromes and I don't like that word, but that's what every one of you knows. So the, the, those, those enterocytes fit together very tightly and the tax on their immune system becomes less, at which point it stops making these goofy errors about attacking your own thyroid or attacking your elbows in psoriasis or attacking your joints in rheumatoid arthritis. You know, those types of autoimmune problems throughout my clinic have gotten better on a, on a keto diet. Um, but when I push them to a PKD, I am I'm so impressed at how well they're able to do. Um, as I look at uh, some of the uh, some of the other things, here's again a standard American diet. So for those of you saying, well, what's the difference between what I used to be eating versus now? There's lots of examples of these out here, but I still like to take a minute and say, if you start with you know 30% fat, 15% protein, and about 55% carbs, uh, that is usually in the 100 to 300 to sometimes 500 carbohydrates a day in some of my patients when they enter the um, program. Um, but looking at f folks taking the intestinal permeability test when they start out on a standard American diet, uh, and then they move to the really advanced diet of a PKD. Again, that is not for the lighthearted. That is a very difficult transition. So here again, those, those are the examples of the standard American diet. All of those are leaking too much. Most of my patients have gut issues that they don't know why it's you know, grown worse over the last 30 years, but uh, if we took um, a really special biopsy of their intestines to look, we could see that three weeks on that PKD makes it totally worth it though, uh, where they say, wow, uh, I cannot believe the number of symptoms that are better. And of course, in my mind, I wanna know how long, you know, when can I start adding foods back in? And when I can see that if they're on a paleolithic ketogenic diet for three weeks, knowing that I finally am getting those intestinal cells to bind back together, to stop those foreign objects from coming in, um, if we can do that for, look at that, three years on a PKD, bam, that's like the healthiest version of a gut I've ever seen. Uh, so here's another one. Here's a paleo diet and they're like, you know, doc, I can do your diet as long as I get my, you know, my little shot of gin at night or my little shot of whiskey at night. Um, and so they're two months on PKD. Uh, but look at that, Those, that alcohol continues to keep that swelling happening on a cellular level in the gut. Uh, the, the reconnection of those cells is inhibited by, the, by alcohol. 
And then finally, uh, this is uh, the worst of the worst. When patients write in and say, my mom is uh, about to take on chemotherapy, my dad is about to start chemotherapy, they're, they're malnourished, their vitamin D is low, their iron is low, um, the doctor's worried about the ketogenic diet using the muscle tissues to feed their body, and I just think of my Crohn's disease because that's what happens when they, over time, um, they are very difficult to take care of. They, are, they have intestinal permeability problems, phase four, these also Ulcers aren't just one in a little spot. They have hundreds of them throughout from their esophagus all the way down to their anus. That, that gut lining has thousands of ulcers. And the, the amount of nutrients that just kind of goes out into the toilet uh, and then the inappropriate things that your body is letting into your system, it is overwhelming their immune system. They're, we cannot fix them until that settles down. Uh, again, this 16-year-old, is one of the best documented cases I've ever seen of uh, Crohn's disease. I've had patients in my practice where we have cut out their gut. We couldn't, they had so many ulcers. We just said, forget it, let's just cut it out. That's, it's such a sad moment for us because we know for the rest of their life, they're never gonna have a chance of being normal again. Had I known that this could be an option for them, uh, I have lots of, lots of uh, uh, years of practice left where I'm going to reverse uh, some more Crohn's disease to make up for the ones where I recommended that they cut out their colon. So here's a Crohn's patient four months into PKD. That's actually pretty normal for, for a Crohn's disease to have at least half of those proteins in the normal range. Uh, when you get out to 10 months on PKD, I, I, I can't tell you how powerful that is. Uh, that immune system is the hardest patient for me to take care of. Um, when I look at, um, I thought there was another one there. This is just another way to look at C-reactive protein or a SED rate, a way of saying what is the inflammation of these folks with uh, chronic uh, inflammatory diseases like Crohn's disease. And you'll see for the first 14 mon months they were using standard uh, treatments. Uh, those medicines at the top with uh, mesalamine, uh, pantoprozole, uh, azathioprine, uh, these are all immune modulating, uh, trying to keep the immune system from attacking, but also how do you keep the defense system up? And you can see they had really given it a, an all-American try of every medication possible to help this gut work right, even to the point where they were formula feeding. And then they just said, before we send you to surgery, let's just try this really advanced PKD where it's red meat, it's eggs, there's no dairy, uh, no seed oils, no supplements, uh, no none of the spices that all come in supplemental kind of things like cumin and cinnamon and they said, no, we're just gonna go with a, with a very uh, organ-based uh, red meat diet with high fat, two times as much fat as protein. And oh my goodness, look at that, 15 months later. This takes it out even further to now 35 months. Uh, and although they didn't get a PKD, or excuse me, a PEG 400 test done, uh, they were able to measure the inflammatory markers out as recently as January of this past year. Uh, what a gift to this young boy who has uh, an immune system that wants to attack its own bowel, uh, often very genetically related and Many of the times I've educated patients, I've said this is your this is your genetics, and I wish I I wish I would have had this information for them. So this gets me back to: Can ketogenic diet have be too strict? So when I'm looking at patients and asking them to keep track of those worksheets that, um, again, is in the show notes if you want one of them that I use for my patients, um, here's some of the things that I talk about. When I look at the energy that they have, they get o over two and a half times the amount of energy um, produced uh, for in a ketogenic diet for the same amount of um, molecules processed through that Krebs cycle uh, in a standard American diet. The amount of oxygen needed to supply and meet the demand demand of your cells much lower in a ketogenic diet than it is in a standard American diet. Uh, this is the part that's very shocking to patients is that uh, the need for vitamins is less in a ketogenic diet. Uh, the number of times I have recommended a, um, a multivitamin for my patients uh, and every study under, since I've been advising patients for 20 plus years, has says you need more
more vitamins. But the key was, if you look at the cellular level, if you stop leaking out the, the vitamins that were never supposed to exit, uh, it's a much better uh, equation for the net amount of vitamins needed for your system. Also, you can hardly put a, a, an organ meat uh, next to a vitamin and ask uh, which one is going to be better absorbed and better used by the human body. And the organ meat is gonna win every time for vitamin C, for um, the fat soluble vitamins, um, for your B12, those, uh, those uh, nutrients have been around for as long as we've been evolving. And that amount of vitamins that we put in our system should not need the intensity that we've had if our gut lining really was sealed tightly. Um, again, digestive enzymes are about half as much on a ketogenic diet. The amount of food, again, why do we lose weight on a ketogenic diet? Because eventually, once our metabolism gets going, that nutrients, that satisfaction, that satiety is much easier to obtain on a ketogenic metabolism as opposed to a standard American diet. And there's part of where this uh, weight loss comes from. The need for water, I mean, again, your body's thirst mechanism is very primitive. You are not gonna be able to outsmart how much water your system needs. And when you're in a ketogenic state, you do not need nearly as much as your body needs when you're having that excessive amount of processed carbohydrates. Um, again, the need for protein or nitrogen is higher on a ketogenic diet, but the need for carbs is a big fat goose egg. Please do not miss that. Uh, that is a powerful summary statement for um, what happens in a ketogenic state. Again, the, the storage of, <laughs> of uh, energy and then your insulin, the storage of energy. Again, ketogenic diet doesn't need as much as uh, your standard American diet does. Finally, your insulin levels on a ketogenic state are much lower uh, than they are on a standard American diet. Um, I'm just going to give one little shout out here to, to say here is just a, an accumulation. I put all of these um, patients that they'd kept track of from May of 2016 to about October of 2017. And I just think it's a powerful testimony for this team of researchers to be able to keep track so people like me that cannot order this test can really learn from what happens to patients on a ketogenic diet. And if they really follow the advanced, the most advanced ketogenic diet that we can recommend, uh, what does the evidence say? What is that um, data? And so this is just an accumulation of all the different data points I found uh, and put them all on one chart just to make sure I took a moment to give a shout out to this team saying thank you for teaching uh, the Americans about how this uh, diet can be measured, especially on this intestinal level. Uh, I know this is what saved my mother's life uh, when she was fasting for nearly 40 days as a 71-year-old female uh, with cancer. Um, and I will, I will uh, summarize one more thing uh, for, um, uh, hold on one second. I, so I will summarize one more thing for what happens when your Dr. Boz ratio uh, and you're measuring it on that spreadsheet. And you all, if you've been watching this channel, know that if you get it under 80, bam, we know you've got a really good chance of um, weight loss. That autophagy is a pretty good shot. If you get it under 40, this is what I reach for every week when I fast. I fast until I get a Dr. Boz ratio of 40 or less. And I'm really looking to improve my immune system, improve my metabolism, and really challenge it one, uh, one week at a time, one step at a time. But boy, my most advanced and sickest patients before I ever knew about the research that's coming out of uh, Dr. Clemens office, uh, I was uh, following doc Dr. Seafried's advice, which is get that uh, ratio of ketones to glucose low enough until you get numbers where a Dr. Boz ratio would be under 20. And so usually the next thing that I hear folks asking about is, all right, we get this Dr. Boz ratio is taking your glucose and then dividing by your ketones and that the longer you go on, the less those numbers get for a Dr. Boz ratio. <clears throat> we know that this is a reflection of insulin that you can measure on a point by point by point process. Um, but uh, the question that most people uh, come back and say, well, doc, how long should I keep that number under 40 or under 80? Uh, and I think those are the kind of questions that um, when I am looking at uh, the answers for that, let's actually go up to this one. Uh, when I'm looking at the answers for how long do you keep a Dr. Boz ratio under 40, the answer has to do with 
why are you keto? What is your purpose? Um, if you're doing this for weight loss, then you should really reach for a, a, a Dr. Bob's ratio of 80 and try to hold it there most of the time. Um, that's not easy. And so I don't ever say that with a blanket statement. I tell folks, hit it and then have a meal. <laughs> hit it and then have a meal. Um, and I look at that for, for folks who are not used to intermittent fasting. They are not used to going without a meal. Uh, there are a, a huge huge advantages to the journey of patients getting better at their ability to uh, you know, give one meal a day. And you've seen a few folks on this channel where I've asked them to have one meal every other day, that's every 48 hours. And that was based on looking at how did their body progress as they stopped eating. And then what happens every time they eat is that that ratio will go back down. Uh, when you look at the journey of turning off that immune system, really stopping it from attacking itself, or getting a, an improvement in some of the hormones that really do help our system fight off infection, repair diseases, fight cancer. All of those are found as these ratios get better. Um, if you've read the book uh, any way you can, you know that my mom uh, fasted for 40 plus days at a very critical point of her um, of her uh, journey, and it was a very it was. It was scary. She uh, was facing a funeral. She was facing the end of her life if she didn't stick with this. And it was the only option we had left. Um, I'll save you the details because they are pretty gruesome and they're in the book. Uh, but uh, we said, all right, this is all we've got. And I actually started out thinking I could do this with her, but I failed at like three days. And in part, it's because I didn't have the need or the intensity of that, that motivation of a life-threatening issue at the end of, uh, end of life that like my mother did. Uh, she was 72 at the time. She was fasting for 40 days. She had never done that in her life before, but her Dr. Boz ratio got down to under 20 and we kept it there for nearly a month. How did we do that? She had a fourth of a cup of bone broth every day for a month, for th almost 40 days. And th I'll tell you, that's not what I recommend to most patients. This was a very extreme situation. But when people write in and say, well, wh what should I do with the Dr. Boz ratio now that I hit this number? And I'm like, um, first of all, if you're gonna look one number a day, if, I mean, these little test strips can be expensive. If you're looking at one number a day, I recommend first thing in the morning. That is when your metabolism has the least amount of noise, least amount of other factors that change what happens. You're gonna have a cortisol surge every morning that wakes you up. It's based on the sun. You cannot get away from it. Even if you have the night shift, your body still does that. And I wanna see what does your body do in response to that cortisol surge. So checking a Dr. Boz ratio first thing in the morning, very powerful for improving um, your understanding of how strong is your metabolism. Um, I know that if I look at my Dr. Boss ratio later on in the day at the end of my fast, I can get a number under 40. So I've learned just don't look because I'll, <laughs> I'll want to eat. So I try really hard to you know document it as much as possible, but say to myself before I check it, no matter what the number is, I'm still going to try to make it to tomorrow morning uh, because I really am looking for that best reflection of my metabolism by looking at the ratios first thing in the morning. I tell people before you get off the toilet, just sit there and check your numbers. It really is the cleanest numbers for a met metabolic check is first thing in the morning. And if you can get that Dr. Boz ratio under 40 and keep it there, you have a huge improvement in the immune system. I will tell you that most people that keep it that low have figured out either how to eat one meal every 48 hours, every one meal every 36 hours, or they have moved to what I say is the most intense uh, ketogenic diet, which is a PKD, Paleolithic ketogenic diet. Okay, um, that is the, <laughs> that's the end of my lecture. Let's get over to see some of your questions. Uh, <clears throat> and um, I just want some feedback to see what did you guys think of that. Uh, it is a pretty intense topic, uh, but really um, I do find a lot of people reaching out to me, asking me for several of the advanced lectures, uh, and there's just not a lot of other places to do that. I will give another shout out that I am speaking in uh, uh, Puerto Rico in November, November 15, 16, 17, that weekend of the uh, uh, 15, 16, 17 in San Juan. And I'll be giving a, a, a lecture I, I am currently working on. Uh, I need a translator for the for the event. And so I'm taking my son who is who speaks Spanish and um, 
quite the uh, quite the um, the uh, the the process to get his uh, Spanish skills up to the level of medically translating. So for those of you out there, pray for <laughs> pray for him, pray for me. All right, so I am going to check my numbers as I watch for your, some of your answers here. All right, so. Uh, Dr. Boz, I ate sardines out of the can. <laughs> so Anna, you win, that's awesome. I ate sardines out of the can uh, like, uh, like you for the first time last, ne last week. Surprisingly not bad, LOL. Currently fasting with you, my sugars are high, ugh. Well Anna, hang in there, sardines are. When you look at the Paleolithic ketogenic diet, I put red meat in there, but the other thing that's allowed is that very highly fatty feet fatty fish, excuse me. Um, your, uh, your answer uh, to, uh, to checking it though is, uh, I mean, your, your call, your, your response to me saying, just try it. I swear that uh, the tuna factory, the people who say, oh, I eat tuna, but I don't eat sardines. I'm like, that's like saying you eat um, uh, the, the rump roast from a cow, but you don't eat the, um, but you don't eat the filet mignon. <laughs> Actually, I push that right through one of the scars. So you can see my sugar over the course of, uh, of this uh, broadcast is actually higher. That's what happens when I get stressed. Mm. Mm, and I do get stressed over this. Uh, all right. Um, and so I didn't have enough blood come out of there, so I got to poke it again. Mm, and I'm a little cold, so one more time. Mm -hmm. So the other thing Anna mentioned was that her sugars are high. Again, I've got lots of folks out there that uh, they do get uh, stuck in that high blood sugar zone. Um, it gets better uh, and you are underneath the surface, slowly, slowly, slowly improving things. I really think that's what, um, when I ask my patients to use, oh, that's not gonna be enough. Ah. Huh. So when you don't have enough blood, this is what happens to your monitor. <laughs> you get an EF. So it says, poke yourself again. Ah, the problem with that is, gotta get another, gotta get another. I was using these uh, are the disposable one-time use ones, so I shouldn't probably use those. <laughs> Oh, I know why I did that, because there weren't any of the other ones. Okay, hang in there. Oh wait, there it is. Okay, so, um, so there's a couple folks putting out there what kind of, uh, what are their favorite sardines? <laughs> I love that. We're gonna increase the sardine market all on, all on our own here. <laughs> all right, so I am going to get a new strip, uh, put it back in my little meter poke my finger again and um, let's see here ah much better mm. all right so again you do not want to put the blood on there until that li that little drop of blood is flashing um, but once you do and I got a nice little uh, um, now it will count down so again, I'm just showing you that I do this uh, uh, as well, checking your sugars, checking your ketones. That is the answer of how extreme is your ketogenic diet. So yeah, it is up from what it was. Um, and that's despite my sugar going up, my ketones did go up. So thanks to my little supplement. Um, and again, I use the one with a little fat in it because I am metabolically uh, keto adapted. My body knows how quickly to turn uh, those uh, fat chains into ketones. I've seen uh, folks run into a little bit of a problem problem when they're early in the ketogenic diet and they're trying to use MCT and they're putting in so much fat when they have lots of fat that they could use as long as their body was used to burning ketones. So I, I do the two week challenge and say, get yourself some BHB. Uh, I love it when you support my channel by buying those products. It really is the way I can dedicate the time to studying this and preparing these lectures. Uh, but there's other places you can find BHB out there. Um, the BHB uh, is a, it's the chemical of, uh, of a ketone. We've been able to make ketones and put them in a, um, in a lab since like the 60s or 70s. It recently has come down in price, although not the perfect price yet, uh, but pretty powerful how well, um, uh, how well the, 
the access to ketones has been. And when I get my sick patients, whether they're Crohn's or cancer or seizures, and they just don't have the support system like my mom did to really improve their metabolism, I say do a two week challenge, one scoop a day, sip on this all day long until you come back and see me in two weeks. And that really has been a, a, a game changer for the folks who say, I don't know if I can give up uh, these kind of cards. I don't know if I can do this. And uh, in, in the end, uh, it really is an awakening to their metabolism, uh, but they, uh, when you put ketones in, it's an appetite suppressant. So you're, you have circulation of ketones. You will see you stop craving carbs as soon as your body turns on those mitochondria. So give yourself a good five days before you even think about changing your diet. Just use the supplement, sip on it all day long. Know that BHB salts, BHB uh, supplements, they only last two to three hours in your blood circulation, so that's why I say sip on them all day long. If you glut them down, sometimes it causes diarrhea for some of the sick patients because of that leaky gut that we just talked about, but also um, then you pee them out. So if you just dose them throughout the day, you'll save your money by keeping a, a nice steady supply of ketones running through your system. And then for heaven's sakes, just check your numbers. If I mean, just like uh, my kids do when, when they want to <laughs> outsmart mom, uh, if I say, well, let's see whose ketones are better, they'll get, they'll say, wait a minute, and they'll go in the other room, <laughs> and they'll drink some ketones, and then they'll come back and say, okay, I'm ready for you to check, as if I don't know that they're doing that, but it's okay, I let them win. Uh, I'm just happy that they're interested enough to check to say, what is your ketone level? And so you can check, you can check to see that the supplement works. It is a very powerful way to just let me biohack and help you get your metabolism started. So, all right, I, um, there was a really good question in here that I was gonna see if I could find. Um, something about protein. Uh, see if I can scroll back and find it. Um, so here's one, uh, Cheryl, even though following all the rules, my morning glucose is always above 100 uh, and it's been getting higher. I'm watching the macros, carb counting, uh, never more than 10 carbs a day, ketones never above 0.7. Uh, longer fasts, yes, but I would also boost those, I would, I would supplement for like, Give yourself 10 days of supplementing while staying on that, that same ratio of keeping those carbohydrates low, um, but you've got a metabolism that's just a little sluggish. It's probably from years and years of, um, of just having high insulin. Uh, I would, again, push you to do just the salts, not the salts plus the fat. Um, you're gonna find a better uh, journey if you just jumpstart those mitochondria to burning ketones. The other thing that happens in people who've been um, insulin resistant for a long time and they start following these numbers, they're like, why, why isn't it better? Why is everybody else's better? And the truth is, is if you look back into their system, they've had a long time of higher blood sugars than they knew about. To undo it, we want to look at trends. So that's what that spreadsheet is really powerful for. You can go back over the course of months, years, and just say, how, how are my numbers now? Kind of getting an average of your glucose is now, knowing that you've got some liver cells you need to empty that are filled with glycogen, if you've got triglycerides floating around your blood, you've got to dump those triglyceride calories into the glycogen and burn through those. So you've got a lot of different um, places where your body is undoing that storage. Finally, uh, a little bit of walk. If you, get, if you can add exercise once your metabolism is started, uh, and I don't mean like go run a marathon, I mean just add a little exercise into the routine and then slowly kind of keep, tra keep track of that. You'll see all of those things improve slowly. Um, all right. I wanted to answer that one protein question. Okay, how do we get enough protein without dairy? <laughs> and to kick the cheese, but have a hard time hitting. Okay, again, um, Wendy Hill is asking, how does she hit the right protein level? I'll tell you, you add a can of sardines, you add a, um, uh, especially fatty red meat. That is very easy to hit your protein number there. Um, bacon, Braunschweiger, all of those, just a few bites of that is really high in fat, uh, really high in a ketogenic numbers, um, and they do get their protein pretty easily. One can of sardines is gonna get you there, so be brave, open the sardines, eat them. <laughs> All right, I am going to sign off. I have um, uh, some other things that need to be done before tomorrow morning, so I am just going to uh, call it a night and say thank you for tuning in. Uh, glad to see we had no glitches tonight. And we here at, uh, at uh, the Dr. Boz Show are improving your health one ketone at a time.
See you next week, everybody.